So I'd like to say thank you for coming today, and uh, thank you for the invitation. I've been working with Jay for actually for a little over a year, I suppose, because the other one got canceled uh, when COVID came along, and along with everything else. Uh, one thing <laughs> I wanted to cover in the uh, introduction, uh, I had uh, six and a half years in the Air Force uh, helping the Air Defense Command get aircraft together running intercepts. Then they joined the FAA and they wanted me to keep them apart. <laughs> so I had to work on that for a little bit. I worked with the uh, National Transportation Safety Board on a, uh, an accident in 1981 in Loveland where uh, it was a mid-air collision and 15 people died there. It was on that uh, NTSB board. Um, I have uh, instructor tickets for single engine, multi-engine instrument, and uh, float planes. Uh, one of my students uh, taught to fly, got his uh, private, he went into the Marine Corps, got involved in Marine Corps aviation, and eventually wound up flying three years with the Blue Angels. Wow. So I was kind of proud of that. That looks good on a resume, but I haven't had a resume for years. Uh, I got the uh, FAA's award, they call it the Orville and Wilbur Wright Master Pilot Award. I got that in uh, 2018 for 50 years of accident-free flying. Uh, doesn't mean that several students didn't try to kill me along the way, but uh, I made that. Uh, volunteered for Make-A-Wish for uh, 32 years, Children's Hospital for 33, uh, the Boulder County Respite Program working with uh, uh, individuals that have full-time caregivers that need a respite or a break. Uh, I've been doing that for about four years in the Audio Information Network of Colorado uh, where we uh, read magazines and books to the visually impaired. I see some heads bobbing like they may hear those once in a while. Anyway, and uh, my presentation today is uh, My American Hero. Uh, I heard about this guy when I was, before I was a hairy-legged little boy. My granddad used to listen to the news at 5 o'clock every afternoon on the radio. And woe be it to any young man who made too much noise so Grandpa couldn't hear the news. And it seemed like there was always something on there about Jimmy Doolittle. Races that he had ran and, uh, and then later on, of course, the uh, Tokyo Raid. Uh, and I thought, you know, that guy is really, really great. And as fate would have it, wound up in 1988, uh, having about a four hour brunch with the general in California. And I'll get into that a little bit later. Uh, have we got pilots in here? One, two, three, okay, four. Uh, Jimmy Doolittle was a pretty darn good pilot. Uh, about probably close to the best pilot the U.S. ever put out. But uh, I thought he was quite a guy. He was born in Alameda, California in 1896. And when he was about four years old, his dad had heard that in Nome, Alaska, you could go up there and walk down the beach and pick up gold nuggets. So he was sucked into this. So he packed up the whole family and they moved to Nome. Now, Jimmy was... Uh, Four. Uh, this was much later on in life. Looked like three stars in that, but uh, when uh, Jimmy got to know him, he was about four years old and went to school there. And because he was small, he was picked on by the bullies all the time. That, and there was one other thing that made these bullies pick on him a lot, and it may have been his haircut, different than what this one is. I always thought that his mother really wanted to have a girl. And, uh, and the bullies didn't like the fact that this kid was running around school and all the girls thought those curls were just fantastic. So Jimmy decided he didn't want to put up with these bullies. He started taking boxing lessons. And he wasn't a chivalrous type of a boxer where he would step up and say, okay, you get the first swing and then I'll go ahead. He's, he said, that doesn't make any sense. So Jimmy always got the first swing, followed by several combinations, all right here, right in the nose. 
because even bullies didn't like to see their own blood. So Jimmy turned out to be a good boxer. Uh, when he was about 21 or so, he wound up down in San Diego in the uh, Aviation Cadet or the Army Cadet Corps, and this was his ride, the JN-1. Uh, probably none of the pilots in here ever had a chance to fly one of these. I've never had, but I would sure like to try it. Jimmy learned how to fly the same way that most of us learned how to fly. Uh, the uh, two-bucket method of flight instruction. The first bucket is labeled experience, and Jimmy's bucket was completely empty. He didn't have any experience at all uh, doing any flying. The second bucket is the luck bucket, and it's full of luck. So the trick is to fill this one up before this one's empty. Is this ringing a bell with you guys? I, I kind of figured it would. So an empty bucket of experience, but a whole lot of luck here that he could bet on. So early in his flying career, the very first time he got to fly the Jenny, and this, by the way, was 90 horsepower, the never exceed, never exceed speed was 75. Uh, you soloed it from the rear, and the climb rate on this was fantastic. You could climb 2,000 feet in only seven minutes. <laughs> And I know some of you guys were flying some airplanes that were probably had a little better climb rate than that, 2,000 feet, and hadn't even got the gear up yet. His very first flight uh, went out with his instructor. And as I said, they were taxiing out, not to the runway, but to a field. Because in those days, just a big wide open field, and you pulled out there and figured out where the wind was coming from and take off into the wind. So while they were taxiing out, they heard this really loud, ungodly noise. And pieces of airplanes started falling on their airplane and a body. Two Jennies had got together and they had a midair right over the top of them. So the instructor shut the airplane down. They got out, tried to do what they could to help clean up the mess and everything and get the bodies hauled off. The airplane looked okay. They checked it all out. And the instructor turned to Doodle and he said, back in the airplane, we're flying. And that was when Jimmy Doodle had to make up his mind. Do I quit or do I get back in the airplane and try it? So he got back in the airplane. So that was the first, oh, my luck has turned the wrong way. The first bit of luck that went out over into the experience bag. So he went ahead and flew. He soloed in seven hours and four minutes, which I think was probably pretty darn good in those days, especially trying to uh, run a tail dragger around and using only the rudders to steer it and no brakes or anything underneath. He said that, uh, he might have quoted somebody else in this, but he said his first solo in an airplane was a lot like making love to his first girlfriend. And I asked him about that when I was uh, having breakfast with him. I said, what were you talking about? And he said, well, he said, first off, he said, I didn't know a hell of a lot about what I was doing. <laughs> he says, it was over way too soon. And I couldn't wait to do it again. <laughs> that ring a bell for you uh, pilots in the front row there? It, it certainly does with me. Do you remember the first solo? You never forget your first solo. So he, <laughs> uh, he had a couple of other things. Once he, got, uh, once he got soloed and he could go out and fly by himself, uh, he wanted to see what the airplane would really do. And I guess this comes with any pilot. Get it up, 75, that was supposed to be the max speed, but he put the nose down, run it up to 75, listen to the wind whistling through the wires on the wings, wondering if the airplane's gonna stay together still stayed together, push it down, get it to 80. 
Next time he would fly maybe 85. So he was always pushing the envelope on this thing every time he went up. He uh, was out flying one day and he found uh, a couple of soldiers walking up a dirt road. And the two soldiers were talking to each other and had their heads down. And Doolittle thought, I'll just show these guys what an aviator looks like up close. So he rolled over, made a pass across these guys. And as he went by, he looked back down and they're still looking at each other and talking. He thought, well, I guess I wasn't low enough. So he made a 180 and turned around and come back. And this time he got lower. As he went across these two soldiers, he heard a thump. He looked over the side and he had hit one of those guys in the back of the head with a wheel of his airplane, <laughs> knocked him to the ground. And as he looked back up, he was too low, got tangled up in a barbed wire fence. And that fence started just coming apart and following him and he finally smashed into the ground. The first guy at the airplane to help him out of there was the guy that he hit, still bleeding from the head. But uh, it was okay. He ruined a $10,000 airplane, but he had a little bit uh, of this luck and just put it over here and had a little more experience. So he's starting to get this full. This one's starting to go down. Of course, the colonel wanted to talk to him. <laughs> had to go see the colonel, and the colonel grounded him for a week or two, and he thought, okay, I've learned something there. All of the pilots in those days, probably like today, I'm not real sure, all wanted to be fighter pilots. Didn't want to fly anything big, but they wanted to fly fighters. And they had a way that they could practice this a lot because there was an area not too far from their base that had a pond with some ducks in it. Doolittle would go out there in his jenny and pick himself out a duck and get on its tail. So whatever the duck did, Doolittle was right there trying to stay with him all the way through. He got the wrong duck one day. The duck was trying like mad to get away from this noisy, greasy, oily thing behind him that was making this noise and chasing him. And Doolittle just had him boresighted. Every time the duck would move, Doolittle was right there following him. Finally, the duck rolled over on his side and made a left descending turn. And Doolittle looked down, watched him go away, and thought, I got the best of that duck looked up and the duck had taken him up a blind canyon <laughs> and then got the heck out of the way. So Doolittle, pulling back on the stick, trying to ease it back, get over there, ran out of airspeed and altitude and ideas all at the same time and ruined another $10,000 airplane. I don't think we're keeping the tab. <laughs> <laughs> so he had to go see the colonel again and uh, Cheryl just reamed him, and uh, uh, I think he was probably grounded for another two or three weeks. But uh, the, one of the things that had happened is when that airplane went in, uh, it went in hard enough that it not only ripped his uh, flying suit in the back, it ripped his pants underneath and his underwear. So the whole rear end was hanging out. So when he got back to the base, he was going to try to get over to the barracks, get his clothes changed, because he knew he was going to have to go see the colonel. Uh, they caught him and said, nope, you've got to go right straight to the colonel's office. He wants to talk to you. So there he is standing there talking to the colonel. It's real breezy in the back. Colonel grounded him, told him to get the hell out of his office. Doolittle thought, I can't just turn around right here. So he saluted, took a couple of steps back toward the door, Got a little closer, the colonel still waiting, saluted the colonel again, turned around, grabbed the doorknob, opened the door, ran out, ran through the orderly room and all the way back to the barracks with his butt in hanging out. He knew that if he turned around there, the colonel was going to take it personally. Got back to the barracks and one of the guys said, well, did you get chewed out? He said, what do you think? Turned around and They'd heard about how people get chewed out, but they'd never seen the results of it. <laughs> After he uh, had, uh, uh, was, was cleared to solo, there was an auxiliary airport not too far from the base where they trained. Uh, he would take off in his airplane solo, and his buddy would take on in his airplane solo. They'd go over there and land, and the two of them would get into an airplane, 
and try all kinds of things. Worst thing in the world, two students in the same airplane. It's like having two instructors in the same airplane. You never know what the heck's going to happen. Doolittle told his buddy, he said, you know, he said, I'll bet you that when we're flying, that I can get out of the Jenny, crawl down the side, and get between the prop and the leading edge of that upper wing, get down onto the axle, and sit on that axle as you make a landing. The guy said, you can't do that. He said, I bet you five bucks. So they bet five dollars. So Doolittle did that. He climbed out, got down on the wing, and got down, and the guy landed the airplane, and he's still sitting down there on the axle. Collected his five bucks. They went back to the base. Four days later, the colonel calls him into the office. <laughs> colonel had had a visit from a man who was at that field, a uh, film producer, who was taking some film of airplanes flying around for a movie that he was making, Cecil B. DeMille. Cecil showed up at the colonel's office with the film and showed it to him and he said, uh, DeMille said, this is, this is a guy I need to have. He said, I know he's working for you uh, in the Army Air Corps, but he said on the weekends when he's not doing anything, he said, I'd like to have him come out and we'll put him to work. The colonel said no. Then he called Doolittle into the office. Here we go again. They got grounded some more, and just a little bit more out of the out of this bucket over into the experience, and uh, you know the levels are starting to get pretty close to being the same. So he got out of that one. Uh, <laughs> later on, he was sent down to uh, Texas to support uh, Army Air Corps, where they were working against Pancho Villa, trying to capture him. So Doodle was flying almost every day headed down there. One of the places that he used as a landmark to get down to where he was supposed to be working was a place called uh, the uh, Pecos River High Bridge. And it was two big columns together. And the lines and everything were stretched across the top. But the distance between those two columns was narrower than the wingspan. So he could not fly through there. And he looked at it every day when he went down there. And finally, one day, he had it all figured out. Headed right straight for the middle. Yep, I see it back there. Right straight for the middle, last second, 90 degrees, through, out the other side. Looked back, and he thought, they did it. Except he's dragging two wires behind him. <laughs> the power line and a telephone line. And thought he was going to lose another airplane, and the colonel was not going to be happy if another $10,000 airplane was destroyed. But he managed to get the, the wires to come off of the airplane and uh, flew it back, landed it, looked at it, and there was no damage on it. So a little more luck out and a lot more experience. It was in the hangar one day, one of the big huge hangars with a huge door on one end and a huge door on the other. There was a mechanic in there sweeping the floor. Doolittle said, you know what? He said, I think I could make that easier for you. He said, I'll be back in about 15 minutes. And he said, stay away from the doors. Sure enough, he took that Jenny out, dropped it down, flew in one door all the way through and out the other side, blew an awful lot of dust off of the floor and back out of the way. And the mechanic thought, this is really great. You know, the guys really helped me with this cleaning up of the hangar. So a little more luck and stick it over in the experience side. You might think that, <laughs> like I did when I first read this, they're training a loose cannon. You know, there wasn't anything that this guy wouldn't do. And it turned out that he was really, really lucky and everything was working out fine for him. Uh, he even checked out in a, uh, the Curtis R3C, uh, a float plane. So, that gave him and me something else in common because I have that float plane rating. Never used it because you can't fly it down here in Colorado. I got it in Alaska. And uh, this one he flew, this was the GB. And this was, uh, Doodle was not prone to uh, any kind of profanity, but he did say publicly that this one was a bitch to fly. 
He said, not only every minute, but every second that you were in this airplane, you had to be on top of it. What does that say on the tail? G B. G E E B E E. Uh, not a B G. That's a, a rock group from long before I was born. But uh, anyway, somebody got the idea that if they took a really, really big engine and put it on an airplane with a small uh, controls, that it would set records. Well, it did. There's another look at it. You can see that just, just for CG purposes, they put the pilot clear back in the tail. But uh, it was quite a machine. Uh, that's not a real good picture, but you can kind of see what the, uh, how big it is in the front. But this was the, the uh, statistics on it, 3,000 pounds, 1,300 cubic inch engine, nine cylinders, 800 horsepower, stalls at 90, a max was 295, and Doolittle went over that. Small control surfaces and a bitch to fly. In 1925, he applied to uh, the Massachusetts Inst of Institute of Technology for an aeronautical engineering master's program and graduated from that. Turned right around the next day and started the PhD program. So he was the very first Dr. Doolittle. So he had uh, a doctoral degree in uh, aeronautical engineer, the first person that had gone through that. One of the things that he was most famous for is this, the first blind takeoff and landing. And he had worked with these instruments and realized that uh, he could do it, but he did take a safety pilot with him just in case. Pulled that uh, left side up over the top and was completely enclosed. So there were no air traffic controls bugging him while he was doing this, no coffee service. And uh, he managed to take off and land, and the guy in the back seat never touched a thing. So uh, that's where your, your instrument, uh, instrument flying came from. Can you imagine what our uh, aviation uh, industry would be like if you couldn't fly on instruments? Uh, it would be a real, real mess. And then, of course, there was the raid. Initially, he worked for Shell Oil Company, helping them design or, uh, and uh, make 100-octane uh, fuel, 100-115-octane, so that they would have a, a real definite advantage over Japanese and German airplanes. So he worked for Shell oil for, oil for a long time. He was in the reserves. He was a lieutenant. In 1940, they decided that since we were at war with uh, the Germans that the Japanese probably weren't that far behind. So they pulled him out of reserves and put him back in the regular uh, Army Air Corps. And uh, he went from a lieutenant to a major. So he was never a captain. So that was only the first, yeah, that was only the first time that he skipped a rank. There was another one. And the raid, they had, uh, he picked the 17th bomb group out of Pendleton, Oregon, and that was Bill Bower's group. Uh, those guys had been flying to B-25 for quite a while doing uh, patrols up and down the Pacific coast. And they knew the airplane, they were damn good. So he went over there and, uh, or at least sent a message that the whole group was to take all of their B-25s and go to Minnesota and have long range tanks installed. The guys didn't know what for, but they knew that that's what, what the orders were. Once the airplanes were all modified, they all went to Florida, and they were working with the Navy down there on a, a runway that was marked off so that it looked like a carrier deck and uh, taught these guys how to make short field takeoffs. <clears throat> Doolittle came down and introduced himself and told them that if they were thinking about what might be in store for them, it was probably wrong, but don't talk about it to anybody. Don't talk about it to your wives because uh, the FBI and other uh, agencies will be watching and listening. And if you're violating any of those security orders, you're out. So they didn't have any idea what they were gonna do, but they did know that if Doolittle was in charge, they wanted to be a part of it. 
let me see if there's there's a picture of the only one that I could find a picture of the Hornet with the 16 B-25s on it going underneath of the Golden Gate Bridge. This was uh, early April of uh, 1942. Uh, Doolittle had sold this program to the Army Air Corps and uh, said that you could take a medium bomber and take off from an aircraft carrier with a full load of fuel and a load of bombs and fly to Japan if you got close enough. Yes, sir. Was there any concern that there might be Japanese spies in the San Francisco Bay Area that would notice the ship? You know, the books that I've read never touched on that, but this is how it left the harbor. I mean, there wasn't any way they could hide these. But there was no attempt to camouflage it, to cover the plane? No. I mean, we no. were putting Japanese in internment camps. Right. We were worried about spies. Yeah. How, but, how about but, 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 uh, but, 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 at night? I'm going to bed that there was so much, so much sea traffic going in and out of San Francisco at the time that they just counted on this being just one more ship. Yeah, and they probably thought this was just going to go out to sea for a little ways and see if they could they're get just, the B-25s off. Don't, don't worry about yeah. it. Yeah, that's right. So that's how they left, and that's so an how, actual. How did, how did they, there's no flight deck space to take off. They do. Well, when they got ready to take off, they just backed them all up. Uh, I've got another couple of pictures. They started on the back and turned them 45 degrees or so and just kept backing them in there. And as it turned out, they only needed half of the deck because the Navy officer that was giving them the go sign, uh, he had a plan in uh, that they could use the bow of the ship to help with their takeoff. Was there a hangar deck? There was a hangar deck underneath, yeah. And one of, the, one of the agreements with the Navy was if they got out to sea and they happened to have uh, Japanese airplanes coming, in order for these people to get their, their airplanes out from below decks, they would push every B-25 overboard. And then the Army guys would be without an airplane. But they'd have all of the airplanes on there to, uh, to take off and, uh, so and guard the fleet. No, they don't have no. Wings like yeah. they have no, they couldn't put them down below deck. So, yes. So, to lift off, what was the minimum air speed? I'm going to get to that in just okay. just a second. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so, because I one of, that was one of the questions I asked Doodle at breakfast that one morning in '88. You know. No, no catapult. Nope. No. Nope. It was not designed at all. In fact, if you look closely. Now this is the way they were set up before, just before they started the takeoff. Uh, first guy was down here and the rest of them were all back behind waiting. But you see these two white lines here? The left one is for the nose wheel and the right one is for the right main gear. That gave them clearance of this right wing from the bridge and uh, so that they could get off of the, uh, off of the deck. This was a model that they used to have here that I borrowed uh, several times, but uh, uh, it was very, very uh, accurate in uh, the way they depicted everything. Admiral Halsey was the task force commander and Captain Mishner uh, was in charge of the, uh, the Hornet. There was one destroyer here called the Gwyn. Everybody heard of the Gwyn? Mike Fellows that was here earlier? Mike Fellow's dad was the executive officer on the Gwyn that escorted these guys out to the Pacific. So, small world. There's another picture of it just, uh, just before they started. And this right here, Mike, I think, told me that this is the Gwyn. So his dad was right in there somewhere as, as the exec officer. But they're all sitting there waiting and ready to go. Uh, they tweaked the engines, and uh, Doolittle had a couple of secrets that he uh, uh, used to make sure that those airplanes would get the maximum amount of uh, distance out of uh, uh, the, the load. Tracy? Yes. Um, I read that um, in preparation um, for the attack, they never actually practiced with a bomber 
taking off from a carrier. No. They only practiced it on On simulated. the ground, right. Why would they not have actually tried it out? I think probably uh, for security reasons. I just talked about you, Mike, so. <laughs> Yeah, for those of you who don't know, this is Mike, and it was his dad that I was talking about. Uh, probably because it, about anywhere they would try that, uh, somebody would have to think, you know, if they're using a B-25 to take off from a carrier, they must have something in mind. And there'd be all kinds of speculation. And, uh, You've got to remember, there's, there's like 3,000 guys on a carrier. That's 3,000 miles. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, there was a lot of things to, uh, to consider there. But uh, being able to take off uh, on the ground in that distance uh, worked out pretty good. Uh, they couldn't control the wind, but on the carrier, they could control the wind and how much air there was coming across the deck. Uh, on the day that they launched, there was a 30 knot breeze blowing. They turned the uh, Hornet into the wind, light lit up all of the boilers and got it going 20 knots. So there's 50 knots of wind right down the, right down the carrier deck. What was, what was their takeoff speed? Doolittle said that uh, his rotate speed was about 55 to get the nose off of the ground or off of the carrier and full flaps and hold it there. And he said 68 was what they needed for flying speed. And I asked him at breakfast, I said, what was your indicated airspeed on the deck? He said it was bouncing from the peg up to about 65, back and forth. So if the timing is right, he only had to pick up three knots and have flying speed. But he got off. Of course, everybody else on the carrier was watching him. Did you try to time the takeoff so the, the bow was rising? Just a second. <laughs> Good question, though. I'm glad I covered it. Uh, there's uh, another shot of... I don't know which one that is, but just all of the, the uh, B-25s on the deck. Uh, this one is uh, the first one, whoop, uh, Doolittle. And this is, this is pure Jimmy Doolittle, if you look. Look at that nose wheel and that line. Couldn't be more than an eighth of an inch either way, and it wouldn't be exactly centered on that. But that's the way Doolittle flew. Uh, this was the LSO here, and he had uh, he had a flag, but the wind was so blowing so hard, he had to wrap the flag around the stick and hold on to it, so he could do this. And of course, he's right there where the uh, uh, aircraft commander could see him, wrap the engine up, and of course they had those uh, the two little aluminum levers that came up with the balls up on the top, pushing them all the way forward. Balls to the walls, that's where that came from. Uh, in fact, just recently, a controller said something to a female captain about balls to the wall, and she said, well, I can't do that, but I'll go as fast as I can. <laughs> I don't know what that means. But uh, anyway, wrapping it up like that, of course, he had the, the power all the way forward, full flaps, looking down the deck. This guy's watching the bow. The bow would come up. And then it would come back down and go down almost like below the, uh, the level of the sea and then back up again. So he was timing it, seeing how long it would take the bow to come down and go back up. When the bow was all the way up, it gave him the go sign, dropped down to the deck to stay away from the prop uh, and the, uh, the wind and everything and not get blown overboard. Uh, do a little come off of the brakes and let it go. As the bow is coming down, he's got a little bit of a slope, helps him just a little bit, get a little more speed, and just about the time he's got the speed, the bow comes up, gives him a little toss into the air. Not much, but just enough to get off. Took off with no problem. So everybody else, the other 15 airplanes, all took off from the same spot, about halfway down the deck. Did it the same way. Bow is high, start the roll, a little bit of a descent down, and then pitched up at the end. Uh, this is a really bad picture. Pardon? Which idea the Brits later stole and put it into their carriers. 
Yeah, <laughs> and maybe they did that with their own airplanes. I'm not sure. Uh, probably with a single, you could use more of the deck uh, just to make sure that you got off. But this was with a full load. In fact, uh, they were discovered 400 miles further away from Japan, and the Navy started filling five-gallon cans and taking them out to the airplanes and tossing them up inside, and they were stacking these five-gallon cans in there. And he told them, you know, use as soon as you can get five gallons of fuel in the tank, take one of those cans and dump it in. But do not throw the empty overboard. If you threw the empties over, you left a breadcrumb trail so that the Japanese could find their way back to the task force. As soon as the last airplane was off, they beat feet for Pearl Harbor anyway. Did Doolittle not have an agreement uh, with Michener that if by chance one of the airplanes would not start, it just simply got pushed over the side? Yep. Okay. Yeah. So everybody that, everybody that was uh, there had started the engines up soon enough, not too soon because they didn't want to use that fuel, but uh, got the five gallon cans on board, <laughs> used all of those first, and then when they were done with it, dumped the whole works at, at one place. Uh, this was taken from uh, somebody in the back <laughs> with probably a brownie box camera that you had to look down in. But uh, it's the only picture that I could find from the inside of any of the airplanes. And there's Doolittle, he's off of the deck and uh, full flaps, you can see that, and it's starting to climb. Uh, as soon as they got in the air, probably about right there, gear up, and then gradually milk off the flaps. Just climb straight out to 50 to 100 feet, a left turn, a downwind, a base, and then flew right back down the deck again. And the reason for that was this uh, ship that they're on, 20,000 tons of metal. So to try to set the directional gyro against the wet compass, was worthless. The compass didn't know what the heck it was doing. It was all over the place. So they'd make a pass down the, the, uh, the carrier, and the co-pilot would look out at the bridge, and this was really, really high tech. There's a guy standing out there with a blackboard and a piece of chalk, and he's writing down the magnetic heading, and he's holding it up when they come by so that they could set the DG and then go on uh, and make the rest of their run. Strict radio silence. Nobody ever said anything during the entire trip. So first guy's off, the second guy's feeling a little better. Uh, second guy gets off. The seventh airplane was Ted Lawson. And Ted wrote uh, 30 seconds over Tokyo. And uh, he had a little problem when he got to, after he got done with the raid. But anyway, Ted was the seventh one. And he taxied up, and he took off. And as soon as he got into the air, the airplane went down and disappeared from view. And he's right on the, right on the water. And finally, the bow came back down, and they could see him. And he was struggling. But he got the airplane uh, enough flying speed that it was safe and ready to make his turn around. And Lawson, of course, called for the gear up right after they got off. And then he called for flaps up. And the co-pilot said, we didn't put them down. <laughs> so 15 B-25s proved that you could get off of a carrier with full flaps. One B-25 proved that you could do it without the flaps. Not the way it was planned, but he made it. Bill Bauer was number 12. And uh, by the time he was ready to come up, they were pretty confident because everybody else had made it. As it turned out, there wasn't any accident on any of the takeoffs. One sailor uh, got behind the B-25 that had both engines running and almost under full power. It blew him over backwards and into a prop, and he lost an arm. And that was the only uh, casualty of any kind on the carrier. So when Bill came up as number 12, uh, he was, he was pretty, pretty sure that he was going to make it because uh, everybody else made it. The thing that always wondered or bothered me is how did Ted Lawson get up there? 
and run the airplane up and get off without somebody <coughs> seeing if the flaps were up. Uh, it just is amazing to me. The uh, LSO you would think would be out there, you know, kind of doing a little check. Uh, and there's enough guys running around there that knew that everybody else had taken off with full flaps. Uh, how that happened, I don't know. Never could find anybody that would admit to it, especially the Navy. I think it's called checklist. Pardon? Checklist. You know, actually, they weren't using checklists. They weren't? No, I don't think checklists came in until about 43 or so. Uh, it was all up here. And they had so many accidents here in the U.S. in training that somebody said, you know, maybe we should just take a piece of paper and kind of, you know, scribble down some of the things we need to do before takeoff. And uh, that's what I had read somewhere that they finally said, yeah, we'll call it a checklist. <laughs> you know, it's something to do while we're taxiing out and have nothing else to do. Um, the Norton bomb sites were removed from all of the airplanes, and they had a <laughs> had a little system of a couple of pieces of plexiglass about so long and about so tall and pretty thin, and they put those two together with a bolt so that they would turn this way, and one of them was set level, as close as they could get to level in the airplane. And the other one, uh, the, the the altitude didn't have anything to do with it because everybody bombed from 1,500 feet. But they could take this and turn it based on whatever their speed was. It indicated airspeed and kind of guess at what the winds might be. So if it, you're going real fast, it would turn this way. And you just kind of look down there. And when you saw the target right on the end of that, you let the bombs go. And uh, militarily, skippy. Didn't hardly do any damage at all. But what it did for the American morale was something else. Uh, everybody was talking about Doolittle's Raiders. Uh, I do remember that as a very young boy. Uh, they had bombed Japan for the first time, very first time in Japan's history. First time they'd ever been bombed or invaded. Uh, <clears throat> see a question? No, I was just thinking way it pricked the ego of the Japanese high command was all, all proportional to the military effects. Yep, and they hadn't done an awful lot to defend the homeland because nobody had ever attacked they them. They decided that they were in, invulnerable. Yeah, and now all of a sudden there were 16 airplanes flying over the top of them, so they started pulling the airplanes back, troops back. Uh, all back to the homeland, which was good because it took them away from Wake Island and some of those other places where they were just going like mad. <coughs> so anyway, that was another airplane off. Uh, this was taken from one of the other ships, probably the Gwyn. Who knows? But a uh, uh, pretty good rate of climb if you, whoop, if you look at it. Uh, there's the end of the deck, and there's where the airplane is. So. You know, taken into that kind of a headwind, it, uh, it had a lot to do with it. And there's the rest of them all sitting back there, uh, chewing their gum, <coughs> swearing, <laughs> waiting their turn to get up there. There's an excellent rate of climb. So you can see that by the time he got over the end of the deck, uh, he had enough airspeed to really put a rate of climb on it to get up and get out of the way. And that way they could fly back, come down to carrier deck, and not bother the other guys that were trying to get off underneath. I, I looked up the rated bomb load, and it was 3,000 pounds. Did they run with a full bomb load? 25,000 pounds was gross. Okay. They were grossed out when they put those five-gallon cans on. Okay. But they figured, OK, you don't have to worry about density altitude. <laughs> not on a carrier. Uh, so the airplane's going to perform, you know, Pretty good as long as the engines keep running. Um, but 68's what he needed to get off, and he did. And you know, of course, the Navy helped a lot in drawing those those two white lines right up to the edge of the deck. So uh, you know, when you couldn't see the lines anymore, you better by God be in the air, get the heck out of dodge. See, that's a heck of a rate of climb there. But you know, they trusted the guy that was in there. Uh, this is later on when he got uh, the, uh, the fourth star. And the, uh, that's the, 
get the wrong button here all the time. That uh, this guy is the president. I've forgotten his name, but Barry Barry Goldwater. I've forgotten his name and don't remind me. Uh, had a little problem with him back in '81, but uh, little argument that he won. Something like that. Yeah, I seem to remember that. Uh, let's see. Here's uh, kind of an overall look. It took. Uh, they didn't go by Pearl at all. They took over this way and uh, spotted early, bombed Japan, made a left turn afterwards and headed down towards China. And as I said, no, no real uh, military damage to the place, but sure, sure did a lot for our morale. Barry, I thought I read something that said the Enterprise was also along that flying yes. air cover. Yeah. You hardly ever see it mentioned at all. Yeah, the Enterprise and the Hornet and the Gwyn, those are the only three that I know of. There was a couple of more support ships and stuff in there too, but uh, yeah. And as soon as the last airplane got off, they put 61 airplanes in the air in 60 minutes. So they, uh, they did almost as good as Chicago O'Hare Tower. Um, get them into the air. After the raid, they made the hard left turn and uh, Chiang Kai-shek was supposed to have built a runway in China with a beacon so that after these guys were done in Japan, they could tune in the beacon and fly over there and land in the daylight. But by taking off as early as they did, they were over China in the middle of the night. Chiang Kai-shek decided that he didn't want a beacon in his country because the Japanese could find it. So there they are, headed for China, headed for a runway. It ain't there. And uh, it didn't take them long to figure out that, uh, you know, we're on our own out here. Still, no radio calls, all radio silence. I talked to Bill about this, Bill Bauer. I asked him one time, I said, uh, I said, were you or any of your guys apprehensive about jumping out of your airplane? He said, let's get this straight. He said, nobody jumped out of my airplane. He said, we crawled on our bellies all the way back to the bomb bay door, slid over the side like a snake, hung on with our fingertips as long as we could. We were supposed to let go a count to five. Most of us got to 2.5 and pulled a ripcord. Uh, Richard Cole, who was uh, Doolittle's co-pilot, actually the last one to die uh, in 2018, he was 103. Uh, he pulled his ripcord and he pulled it so violently that he hit himself in the face and had a black eye for three weeks. And everybody was asking him how he got that and he didn't want to tell them. You know, <laughs> I hit myself in the eye, yeah, right. Um, anyway, this was Doolittle's airplane. Bauer told all of his guys on his crew, he said, we're gonna fly this pig as long as we can. When it runs out of fuel, he said, the engines will quit. He said, I'll put it on all the pilot and we all get out of here. And sure enough, the engines quit rang the bailout bell. His navigator bombardier in the front was Waldo Byther, uh, who I always thought had probably had a heck of a time in grade school with a name like that. But uh, Waldo, uh, Bill said Waldo was fantastic. He said he not only knew his job backwards and forwards, he knew everybody else's job on the airplane. Bill said Waldo probably could have landed that airplane not pretty, but he probably could have gotten it down and saved some lives. So Waldo was trying to call from, crawl from the nose of the airplane on his belly back to the Bombay door, which are wide open. Somehow, Waldo caught his D-ring on something in the airplane, popped his parachute. Bill looked down at him and he said, Waldo, you better hurry. He said, we're gliding. Waldo said, no problem, you know. So he gets the back, the pack off, rolls over on his back, starts stuffing silk back into the thing, closed it back up, hooked it like it was supposed to be, put it on, got back to the door, got out, counted to two, pulled a ripcord, and it worked. Bill said, boy, he said, that guy, he said, I wanted him to fly with me for the rest of the war because, because he knew what was going on. Uh, 80 men involved, uh, 
This was Doolittle's airplane, and uh, you can see, I think there's two heads right here. Somebody looking over the airplane, I don't think it was Doolittle. But here's a picture of Jimmy over here. Uh, he'd gotten out okay, but this was taken the next morning by his uh, flight engineer. He'd come out and he'd, uh, Doolittle was looking pretty sad. And uh, Lieutenant uh, Le or, uh, Sergeant Leonard, I think his name was, uh, he said, General, how do you feel? Or not General, he said, uh, Lieutenant Colonel, Colonel, how do you feel? He said, it was, a, it was a big blowout. Lost all the airplanes. As far as he knew, they'd lost all 16 of them. He said, I'm going to go back to the States. They're going to put me in Leavenworth for the rest of the war. And Leonard said, no. He said, I think they'll probably give you a medal and maybe a promotion. And Doolittle said, I, I don't think so. Uh, and the thing that's funny about this is that when Leonard's taking these pictures, he was always upwind. Because it seemed like the day before, when they got over China uh, and Doolittle ran out of fuel, everybody got out of the airplane. And they told him, you know, when you're in the air and you're under, under silk, keep your legs bent because you can't see the ground. You don't know when you're going to hit. If you've got your knees locked up, you know, you're going to break everything all the way up. So everybody was kind of poised for it. Doolittle landed in a rice paddy. And as it turned out, if any of you remember, the Chinese had fertilizer in their rice paddies. It was called binjo. The Japanese called it binjo. But it's human excrement. So here's a guy that's had a really historical day. And what a way to end it. So he gets up. He's walking through the rice paddy trying to find some place to get out of the rain. Because, you know, keep in mind, Thunderstorm, lightning, winds, everything in the air when they got out of the airplane. Got on the ground, he was just glad to be alive. Stumbled around in the dark, found a little shed, opened a door, walked inside, could feel around a little bit, and there was a box there. He thought, oh. Reached up, and the box had a little lid on it. He thought, great, you know. He reached inside, and it was soft. He thought, I'll just crawl up in there, get some sleep because he'd been up for a long time, he was beat. Crawled inside the box and was just getting ready to put his head back and he got to feeling around. Turned out it was a coffin and it was occupied. He thought, no way in hell am I gonna sleep in this. So, so he got back out and got his parachute in the corner and kind of curled up and got as much rest as he could. Anyway, he wound up back on the airplane. Uh, Leonard took these pictures, but like I say, he was standing upwind all the time. You know, he wanted to say, Colonel, you stink. But I don't think you tell that to a colonel. Uh, there's another, the same thing. Uh, and the people that were out there. Of course, this is the way all of the papers looked in the U.S. Bomb Japan. Everybody from the press wanted to know, where did they come from? And what do you suppose uh, Roosevelt told him? Shangri-La. Shangri mm -hmm. The mythical city doesn't exist. But uh, he didn't give away anything either. Because at that time, uh, those, uh, the rest of that uh, task force still trying to get back to Pearl. And still probably within range of the Japanese. So don't, don't say anything. They bombed Tokyo, Yokohama, Yokosuka. Kobe, Nagoya, I've been to some of those places and they're, they're really pretty now. Uh, let's see, Bill's three um, souvenirs that he had, uh, he said the D-ring from his parachute, his pocket knife, which he'd had as a kid, and the uh, train ticket across India. Those were the three things that he saved out of that. And he told me one time uh, after 9-11 that he uh, went to fly out uh, someplace at DIA, forgot to take the pocket knife out of his pocket, and they caught him. And so he had to give up the pocket knife, and he asked the guy, he said, what are you going to do with this? And the guy said, well, I don't know, probably storage or something. He said, i got to talk to your supervisor. So he talked to the supervisor, and he showed him, he said, this knife 
was with me when I bombed Japan. And this kid didn't know anything about the Doolittle Raiders, but he told him the whole story. And the guy said, I'll tell you what. He said, you let me have it. He said, when you come back, he said, you come back to my area and you ask for me and I'll make sure that I'm here. And he came back and the guy gave him back his pocket knife. And I thought, I have to think about the TSA a whole lot differently now. Uh, but he had the whole story and he got his knife back. Sir? That uh, train schedule for India, that trek back the long way, that was quite a trip back. You know, it was actually a couple of months before he got back to the States. Uh, Did some, you ever write a book about that part of his experience? That would be quite fascinating. Oh, it's in uh, his book, I Could Never Be So Lucky Again. Yeah. And that's where, that was where that came from. Um, oh, and somewhere along the way, they uh, managed to get a telegram back to the War Department that uh, the mission was finished and they lost some of the guys. And, uh, and then he got another telegram back that said, you're now a Brigadier General. So he missed, he missed Colonel. So, you know, by missing two ranks, you can advance pretty good. And, uh, but he earned both of them, I guess, all the way through. So coming back, let's see, Tokyo in three cities, lots of headlines all over the world. Uh, this is uh, Bobby Height. They had, let's see where I've got those. There were eight that were captured by the Japanese. Uh, four, five, seven were sentenced to death. Three were executed. And the other four spent the rest of the war in a Japanese POW camp and got out okay in uh, 47 after the war. So uh, that was war crimes that I'm sure somebody got punished for, I'm not sure. But uh, uh, according to the Geneva Convention, you cannot execute a prisoner. but. They made them get down on their knees and stepped up behind them and put a bullet in the back of their heads. Uh, the other four knew that they were next, but uh, uh, their sentence was commuted to life instead of uh, death. The first time, oh, there it is. Chase Nielsen was killed in a crash when they landed. Uh, Dieter and Fitzmorris also, so there were three of them that actually died when they uh, got to the ground. Farrell, Hallmark, and Spatz were all uh, executed. Jake DeShazar was a POW until the war's end, and those other three guys, Bobby Height. Uh, Bill told me that Jake DeShazar was an enlisted man and was kind of a ne'er-do-well. Uh, always drunk on leave, uh, womanizer, whatever that's worth, um, aren't we all? In fact, I just found out the other day I'm a lesbian. Uh, anyway, uh, Jake came back to the U.S. and uh, got involved in religion and went to Japan to convert Buddhists to Christianity. And one of the guys that he uh, converted was Fuchida, who led the raid on Honolulu, Pearl Harbor. Yeah, that's what Bill told me, and I thought, wow. <laughs> so he did accomplish something out of that. But uh, Doolittle got the, uh, the telegrams, and uh, he was told to report to the White House. And he was going to make the best time that he could to get to the White House because President Roosevelt wanted to see him. So Doolittle sent a telegram to his wife in California said, meet me at the White House on such and such a day. So she said, OK. And of course, the Army knew about that. She got a commercial flight to St. Louis. And then there wasn't anything else commercial in Andrews in Washington. So uh, military picked her up. Of course, military airplanes, you know, all kinds of coffee. And you know what the facilities were like for women on World War II airplanes, zero. Got to Andrews Air Force Base, she got off of the airplane, there was a staff car waiting with a sergeant behind the wheel, and she jumped in the car and she told him, she said, I have to go to the bathroom. 
He said, I'm sorry, ma'am. My orders are straight to the White House, no stops. So she got to the White House, got inside the White House. There's Jimmy standing at the uh, door to the Oval Office. She walks up. Jimmy puts his arms around her. She says, be careful. She said, I haven't gone to the bathroom since St. Louis and a lot of coffee. She said, I'll be right back. He said, honey, you can't go. She said, the President of the United States is in here waiting for us. He's got a lot of stuff to do. He said, you've got to hold it. So she held it. There she is standing with the, the man. Of course, he couldn't get up because of the polio, but pinning the congressional on Jimmy. And I cannot look at her face anymore without imagining what she's thinking. Would you hurry up? She's, yeah, she's got to be thinking, how long is this going to take? And is it a crime if I wet my pants in the Oval Office? <laughs> and how many people have done that before me? Am I going to be the first? And when they got done and she stepped outside, she disappeared. See, that even looks like it's got a little bit of a grimace. But uh, he got the congressional. And there's a picture of her that was the only one that I could find. Really a nice looking lady, Josephine. They called her Joe, of course. In uh, 1943, a lot of the Raiders were in uh, North Africa. Uh, Bill, I think this is Bill Clear over here, but they were in some place where they had liquor, but they had no glasses. <laughs> so they wanted to drink a toast to the guys that didn't make it. So coffee cups worked, uh, whatever the booze was. So this was the very first reunion. And then after the war, they decided they'd have a reunion every year. Bill called them the biggest freeloaders in World War II. Because <laughs> every major city in the country wanted these guys to come on the 18th of April every year. And they would pay all of the hotel, all of the uh, transportation down and back, room and board for the wives, and all of the booze they could drink. Uh, turn a bunch of GIs loose on something like that and watch what happens. Uh, this I brought. Um, I met Bill Bauer because I had a friend that lived right across the street from him over in Boulder. And uh, I was looking at this on my friend's wall. And I said, where'd you get this? He said, I got it from one of Doodle's Raiders. He said, you want one? I said, yeah. I think they were 150 or $170. And I said, where do I get it? And he said, follow me. Walked across the street, met Bill. And he sold me four of them. <laughs> so, so I liked it. It has all of the survivors across here, uh, including Ted Lawson. Ted Lawson never went to one of the reunions. He had a lot of scars on his face from going through the windscreen when he landed, uh, landed half on the water and half on the ground. And uh, of course, he lost a leg over there, left that in China. Uh, one of the gunners, the, was assigned to one of the airplanes was a doctor. Uh, they had gunners on the airplanes, but they didn't have any guns. All they had was broomsticks painted black sticking out. Uh, so they couldn't defend themselves at all. But anyway, uh, Bill told me one year, he called me from his house and he said, uh, go to San Francisco for the reunion in April. He said, after the reunion, I'm going to Chico, California, to Ted Lawson's house. And he said, anything that you have that you want him to autograph, get it to me. And I did. Every one of these that I had, I sent it. So very few of these have Ted Lawson's autograph on them. This one does. And really, really proud of that. I actually sent, <laughs> Bill told me when he started doing all of this stuff and getting autographs, he said, uh, have you got a copy of 30 Seconds Over Tokyo? I said, I don't. So I made three phone calls to Denver, three bookstores. First two didn't have one. The third one did. He said, yeah, and it's in pretty good shape. And I said, how much do you want for it? He said, five. I'd never bought a used book, especially one like this. I said, five what? 
He said, $5. I said, too much? No, no. I said, I'll be right down. <laughs> so I got this home. I sent it to uh, uh, Lawson's wife, Ellen. I addressed it to her and asked her if she would autograph her picture. And I said, by the way, you know, if Ted's around, have Ted sign it too. So I may have the only copy uh, with Ted and Ellen's autograph in the back. And then Bill took it, of course, to one of the reunions. And Bill signed it. And on this page is Doolittle and a whole bunch of the other Raiders that are back there. Uh, I told my brother, I said, if you send me a book, I'll make sure that it gets out to the reunion. My brother's always been known to be a little tight. He said, I've got one at home, and he said, I paid seven bucks for it. He said, if it gets lost in the mail, I'm out seven dollars. <laughs> so he never sent it to me. Oh. So my brother has 30 seconds over Tokyo, and now it's probably worth eight, eight dollars maybe, eight fifty. <laughs> I thought, okay, yeah, whatever you want. So anyway, uh, I got this, and everybody that I showed it to wanted to have one. So 22 was what I sold. And uh, I was going to uh, San Francisco with my wife and my oldest daughter. And uh, I called Bill, and I said, you know, we're going to be in San Francisco. Doodle's down in Carmel, roughly an hour drive. I said, what do you think the odds would be or the chances of having uh, to meet the general. He said, I don't know. He said, let me call his uh, social secretary, which was his second son, John, John Doolittle. And Bill called me back in about three days. He said, it's all set up. He said, you pick the general up on a certain day at a certain time at his uh, uh, duplex. Uh, he was living in a duplex at the time because Josephine had had a massive stroke, and was in rehab, and the duplex was right on the property. So I went down there. There was a Cadillac parked in the driveway, and this was the kind of plate that he had on it. And I thought, you know, Californians take care of their Congressional Medal of Honor winners. Uh, it's just like Doolittle's, except there was a different number on it, of course. So I knew I had the right place. Tracy, we're getting close to uh, noon. Are we getting close to the end? Uh, pretty much. You want me to just stop at noon? No, not for me. <laughs> I want to hear more. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so anyway, uh, we went over, stopped at the general's house. Uh, John was in the garage, and uh, so he stepped out and introduced himself. And we walked inside. He said, Dad's in the bedroom getting his coat on. So I walked into the house, came in from the garage, and there was a long wall like this. And I turned and I looked at it, and across that wall were pictures of Doolittle with every president from Roosevelt to Clinton all across the top. Underneath of it, it was Doolittle with every movie star that was a name and that flew. Uh, Jimmy Stewart, uh, Clark Gable, uh, Bob and Dolores Hope, uh, all of these movie stars across. And back here, out of the corner of my eye, there was a five by seven. And he turned around and he looked at it. Now, I know you guys all in the military, probably in your basic trainings, they told you about the Congressional Medal of Honor. But have you ever seen one? I turned around and looked, and it was Doolittle's Congressional Medal. And it was 40-some years old, so it was a little faded. But it was the first one that I've ever seen in my life, and the last one. I heard the bedroom door open, and he stepped out put his hand out as he's walking across the floor, and he said, hi, Tracy, I'm Jim. And I thought, there is no way in hell that I can call this guy Jim. He came across the floor, still had his hand out, and I remember from my basic training that the Congressional is the medal. And I gave him the best salute I think I have ever done in my entire career. Uh, it had to be, because I didn't know do you have to get on one knee and kiss his ring or kiss the medal or uh, pat him on the back or what? But uh, it was wonderful. So uh, uh, 
we got him in the right front seat, and as I'm starting to drive over there, we had actually reserved uh, in San Francisco a Volkswagen Bug. There's only three of us. And then I got to thinking, we're going down there, and he's going to ride over to breakfast with me. And I thought, not in a Bug, you know, and especially from Germany. So we traded up, got a <laughs> Lincoln Continental four-door. <laughs> Cost me a week's wages. Uh, Anyway, I got to thinking on the way over there that uh, if I even have so much as a flat tire, it will be on the front page of every newspaper in the world. You know, dumbass controller has flat tire with general on board. You know, and I thought, I don't want anything to do with that. So I was very careful. Uh, this got thrown in here. This was uh, Doolittle's grandsons, uh, John and Priscilla, his uh, second son had twin boys. And this was the only picture that came out of me with the general in mid-shoe. <laughs> That's my oldest daughter. And uh, he loved it because he had these two uh, women, you know, with him, two good-looking women. And uh, it was funny. We got over there. It was a table, a round table for six. And we all sat down. And we get the coffee ordered, and I'm trying to try to decide how to start a conversation. I told my daughter and my wife on the way down, I said, this guy had done so much. I said, I just don't even know how to start a conversation with him. And my daughter says, well, Dad, how about something like, so, Jimmy, I hear you fly. <laughs> I thought, no, that's not going to hack it at all. So we're sitting there, all six of us. A woman walks by with a baby carriage with a set of twins in it. And the general said, oh, look at that. Aren't they pretty? And I said, yeah. He said, did you know I have twin grandsons? I said, no. He said, yeah, John and Priscilla had these twin boys. I said, you know, this is really strange. I said, I have a set of twins, and my daughter is one of them. My wife is sitting here, and she has twin nieces. So six out of six people had related to twins. So for an hour and a half, we talked about twins. What kind of diapers, you know, throwaway, washable, uh, how much pablum, when did they start eating uh, food instead of milk, and an hour and a half, you know, I didn't mind talking about twins, but I wanted to talk about twin engine B25s. That's kind of what I went out there for. But that broke the ice. So, you know, an hour and a half talking about twins, and we talked about the raid, we talked about the indicated airspeeds. And uh, it was just a wonderful four hours. And he's me mentally sharp at this time? A little bit uh, tongue-tied. But, uh, you know, when you're in, pres in the presence of greatness, like this group here, you know, it's just, it's amazing. Uh, this is Priscilla. And uh, Priscilla, John, uh, his oldest son, Jimmy Doolittle Jr., uh, was in the Air Force. And according to Bill, Bill thought that he had a, a tough time with a name like that as a pilot, trying to live up to this man. Um, he actually, uh, I forget the year, but he was a major in Austin, Texas, was passed over for lieutenant colonel, committed suicide. And it really hit uh, Doolittle and his wife, Joe, really hit him hard. Uh, the two ladies, my wife and my daughter, uh, another shot outside, and the, uh, there's five of us there. What year is this, 88? Pardon? Did you say this was 1988? 88, yes. Uh, Josephine died two months after we were there. Bill brought this over to the house one night. This was the Tontine, uh, the city of Phoenix, had uh, the reunion one year, and uh, 1958, and not Phoenix, Tucson. And they had gotten together and decided they needed something to give to them. So what this is is 80 solid silver goblets. And if they're standing straight up like this, the name is on the side so you can read it. When they pass away, it's turned over and turned around, and it's upside down, and the name is uh, where you can still read it. 1896 Cognac, 
uh, the same year that Doolittle was born. And uh, it was just uh, 2017, I think, when they opened it, probably spoiled by then. I don't know. I don't know that much about Koenig. Does it spoil? Does it get better? <laughs> anyway, Bill brought this over to the house one night, and uh, they had several friends that had bought this, and they brought their kids over. And of course, uh, Bill didn't come with his wife because she'd heard this thousands of times, the story. But Bill told them all the story of uh, uh, the raid and everything else. And there he is sitting on my hearth. Bill was in charge of that because it was stored at the Air Force Academy at Harmon Hall. So Bill had to go down there the 1st of April every year, bring that home, make sure that's dusted. They had uh, two cadets that guarded it all the time. Uh, they helped Bill get it out into his car, and then he would drive it on out to uh, wherever the reunion was. And just within the last three or four years, they have moved it from Harmon Hall to uh, the Air Force Museum at Wright-Patterson. So it's still there, but uh, all of the goblets are upside down. So it was a real pleasure to have Bill and this in my home. There's Bill on the far side way over here. There's eight of them there. I don't remember which reunion this was, but they always drank a toast to those that had passed before. And uh, there's a little bit more of a Bill, as you remember him. There's Jimmy Doolittle's. Jimmy Doolittle died in uh, 93, he was 96 years old. He, his first retirement check from the Air Force came, and he said, I don't need that, I don't want it, and he sent it back. They sent it back to him a second time, because it was going to screw up their books, if you can imagine our government having... Uh, anyway, uh, they finally decided that he would take it every month, and John was in charge of it. John would wind up taking it to some kind of a charity. So he never, never, take, never took a dime. Uh, his statement was, I am not going to live off of the government tit, whatever that means. So anyway, uh, he was buried in Arlington, and Bill, Bill was the official bugler for uh, the, the Raiders. So Bill was asked to play taps at Arlington. Uh, you don't get a higher honor as a bugler than playing taps at Arlington. He got three notes out and was overcome with emotion and could not finish it. Uh, there was a young man there uh, that uh, was Doolittle's grand great-grandson, and he was a bugler, and he, uh, Bill had handed him the bugle, and his great-grandson played taps at great-grandfather's funeral. Maybe the best pilot we've ever had. So, Let's see, finish this up right quick. Another shot of the uh, tontine and the booze. This is at the uh, Smithsonian. Uh, some of these pictures I've got at home. Uh, this is at Bill Bauer Park, if you've never been up there. It's right up uh, Table Mesa. 3201, you can't miss it. It's on the north side of the road, and it's a really nice park. I was up there for the dedication and met, met Bill's uh, son. Uh, Doolittle's uh, first outside loop, the blind flight, cross continental, under 12 hours. Uh, his career summary, all the way down to uh, chairman of the board, directors, one thing or another. These are all in the back of his book. Decorations, including the congressional. The fourth star, there's three uh, Congressional Medal of Honor winners, all in Arlington. Uh, Boyington on the right, Doolittle in the middle, and uh, Joe Foss, former governor of South Dakota. And I had, uh, let's see, what did I do with this? Boyington had 26 kills, was a Marine. Foss had 24, and Doolittle had no kills, the only bomber pilot out of the bunch. 
his uh, stone in Arlington. This is just before they left the carrier, his crew. And uh, Richard Cole, his co-pilot with the black eye. This is Richard Cole before he passed away. The last one at 103 uh, with Panchito, another B-25. Uh, probably that's, that's probably my favorite uh, picture of Jimmy. And the general would be thanking you for your service. And I think we should return his salute. If you would join me, gentlemen. And thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think that's it. Thanks for coming, guys. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much for See, coming. I went over five minutes. Not a problem. <laughs> thank you. That was great. Yeah. All right. Oh, and uh, for those of you that have never seen it, here is uh, the pictures of the uh, proposed invasion of Japan.